in this world of woe so much suffering and misery our hearts are longing for the endless home of peace and love and harmony no more bitterness hatred or greed paradise is the place we need i feel the peace inside of me Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues. I'm coming to you today with a topic that might surprise a lot of you. And that is that today I'm going to talk about how I became Muslim. Through these talks and through my other works, a number of people have approached me and asked how I became Muslim and why. And if for no other reason than simply to tell the story once, answer everybody's questions, and uh, let people know how I made this major change in my life and in my religion, I've decided to tell the story. The story takes us back to 1990. Before 1990, I was the typical American. I basically subscribed to the philosophy that the person who died with the most toys wins. I had spent my life accumulating different things of this world, and that was the only thing that I knew. That was the only objective I knew in life. In 1990, my second daughter was born. I guess I wasn't listening the first time. When my first daughter was born, Christina, about 10 months before, she did something I had never seen any child do before, and that is that she was able to stand from the very first day of life. From the very first day, if I put her on her feet, she would stand upright by herself. Now, I'm a doctor. I'm a medical doctor. I understand that that is something that a newborn baby is not supposed to be able to do. But I didn't see it as a miracle. I saw it as something interesting, something charming about this child. But I guess I didn't get the message. I guess the message had to come to me twice, and the second time in a more dramatic way. So 10 months later, in 1990, my second daughter, Hannah, was born. Now. Hannah was taken directly from the birthing room in the hospital to the neonatal intensive care unit. And at the time, I didn't know why. They did not tell me. I was a doctor working in the hospital. It was George Washington University Hospital, one of the most famous hospitals in the United States. That was the hospital where President Ronald Reagan went when he was shot. Uh, you cannot fault the medical care at that hospital. They had the highest medical care. So when I found out that my second daughter was blue, I was very concerned. I went and saw her in the intensive care unit from the level of her chest down to her toes. She was a dusky, the only way I can describe it is a gunmetal blue, this deep, deep, dusky kind of blue. Now, for those of you in the medical profession, you understand what that means. A lot of people, even outside the medical profession, understand what that means. But for those of you who don't, you know how when you, when you look at the veins in, in your arms, in a pale-skinned person like myself, those veins are blue. The reason why is because blood, when it is carrying oxygen, is red. When the blood does not have oxygen, it turns blue. And that was the color of my child. We took a cardiac ultrasound. 
it showed that she had a coarctation of the aorta. Now, the aorta is the major vessel that comes off of the heart and then sweeps down to the rest of the body, carrying all of the blood for the body from the chest down. And a coarctation is a critical narrowing in that artery. We could see where the artery was normal size. We could see where it was normal size on the other side, but right in the middle, there was this tight coarctation where the artery narrowed down to almost nothing. So that was the condition of my child. She was dying. Her body was suffocating. Now, as a doctor, I understood what this meant. I had assisted on numerous cardiothoracic surgeries. I knew that this almost certainly meant for this child that she would undergo emergency thoracic surgery. They would cut open her chest. They would replace the vessel with a graft. And these children, in general, don't do well. Given the technology of the time, about 20 years ago, my expectation was that my daughter would have the surgery, survive a few years, need to have the surgery again to replace the graft as she grew, and eventually the graft would fail and she would die. Now, that was my understanding at the time. That was the understanding of the intensivist, the doctor caring for my daughter at the time. So we were standing over this one-day-old baby, not, not even one-day-old baby, whose body was dying for lack of oxygen. And we were just watching her die. They called in a cardiothoracic surgeon from the Children's Hospital across town in Washington, D.C. When he came to see my daughter, I had to leave because I was emotional and I was not helping things. I was not helping them to do their job. I left the intensive care unit. I went down the hallway. Because it's an intensive care unit, there's a prayer room nearby. Now, I remember very clearly walking into that room and praying for the first time in my life with sincerity. And I remember it because I had never prayed with sincerity before. All of my life, I had been in charge. If there was anything that I needed, I knew how to go after it. If there was anything I wanted, I knew what I had to do to get it. I had never been in the position in my life where I faced a situation that I felt I couldn't handle it, where I knew that I was helpless. Now, a lot of people think that I came to Islam through Christianity. In a way, that's true, and I'll, I'll come to that. But at the time, it was not. I was never, at any time in my life, Christian. I used to be atheist. I was one of those who denied the existence of God. In fact, I tried to argue people away from believing in God. When I went into that prayer room, I remember one thing hit me right away, and that is that it was just a prayer room. There were no crosses. No crucifixes, no statues. There were no religious symbols at all. And immediately, I felt it was the right place to be. But because I was atheist, I prayed a prayer which I have since come to know is a little bit infamous. It's a kind of a weak prayer, but it has its strength. And that prayer is, Oh God, if you are there, you have to remember, I had spent all of my life denying God, denying his existence. At that moment, I realized there was nothing I could do 
There was nothing in my worldly power to help this child. And I knew that the only power, if it did exist, that could help my child was the Almighty. So the only way I could pray was to pray, Oh God, if you are there. And I admitted, I was honest. I said, I don't know if you're there or not. But if you are there, I need help. And I made a deal. I made a promise. I asked God if he saved my daughter. And then, if he guided me to the religion that was most pleasing to him, that I would follow. And I remember those words precisely. Asking him to guide me to the religion that was most pleasing to him and promising to follow. Well, I had been away for maybe 15 minutes. I walked back to the intensive care unit. When I entered the unit, the doctors were huddled around my daughter like, like, a, like a football team in the huddle. They were on the other side of the room at one end. When I walked in, they looked up at me and I could see, I could see something had changed. When I walked up to them, the cardiothoracic surgeon just looked me in the eye and said she was going to be okay. The doctors around me did not understand it. He went on to give an explanation. He started talking about a patent ductus arteriosus and how he explained the fact that my daughter was going to be okay. And I looked around at the other doctor's faces and I realized that I was not the only one that did not buy that explanation. And I realized that although that explanation worked for him, it just simply didn't work for me. I had prayed with sincerity for the first time in my life and I could only believe that this was the hand of my creator. We took an ultrasound before that showed this life-limiting condition. We took an ultrasound after, and she was completely stone-cold normal. She never had surgery. She never had medicine. She just went to becoming a completely normal child. As a matter of fact, she entered college this year. When I saw this miracle, I realized I had made a promise. And I realized that if I did not fulfill that promise, I would be blameworthy. So I started searching. I had promised my creator that if he would guide me to the religion most pleasing to him, that I would follow. And the last thing I wanted was to die with that promise being unfulfilled. I would love to continue and finish the story all in one go, but we have an obligation to our sponsors, and so I ask you to be patient, bear with us. We're going to break for a few minutes. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown again, speaking on the subject of my conversion to Islam. And I will just continue the story that I started, telling how and why I became Muslim. So. I started reading scriptures of a variety of religions. I studied Buddhism, Taoism, Shintoism, read into the Bhagavad Gita, started studying Hinduism, worked my way around to Judaism, Christianity, started working myself up the ladder of the revealed monotheistic religions. With each religion I encountered, I basically just came to the conclusion that, well, no, that's not it. It didn't take me long to decide against Buddhism, against Taoism, against Hinduism. That's why I ended up studying Judaism. I, when I studied Judaism, I felt, okay, now, here there is some truth, but there are also some things 
that I did not believe. I found inconsistencies in the Old Testament, which we'll talk about in another show, inshallah. I found the prediction of three prophets to follow, and that obviously raised the question, well, if those prophets do not count as John the Baptist and Jesus Christ as the first two of those three, you know, who else could it be? So I moved on to Christianity. As I studied Christianity, I just was looking for the answer anywhere I could find it. I studied with the Southern Baptists, the Quakers, the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists. My head is kind of swimming with all of the sects of Christianity that I approached for longer or shorter periods of time. And in the end, I could never get my answers. I would go to the priests, having actually done something that, that uh, very few Christians, in my experience, really do. And that is reading the Bible and questioning aspects of it. Now, please understand, I, I don't mean this to put down anybody out there. I don't mean this as a criticism to Christians who hold on to their faith, but I just mean to say that most Christians accept their faith unconditionally without really analyzing it. I found Jesus Christ calling himself the Son of Man, so I wanted the priest to tell me, why do Christians call him the Son of God if he called himself the Son of Man? I found Jesus Christ in three places asked, what is the most important commandment? And he said, no, O Israel, your God is one God. And I couldn't find the Trinity anywhere. I said, well, if the Trinity is not in the Bible, why are people teaching it? Why are people believing it? Why are people following it? Why are people professing it? And they said, well, it's first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. And I found out that that's a forgery. It doesn't exist in the original manuscripts, which is why it has been modified in the more modern Bibles. It is why you do not any longer find in the reputable Bibles published in modern day, you do not find it talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. You don't find that anymore because the scholars of modern times have recognized that that was a misleading insertion. As Schofield's reference Bible states, it's an interpolation. It's a misleading insertion. I wanted the priests to answer these questions for me, and I never found a single one of any sect anywhere who could. I felt almost more lost than before. I believed in what Jesus Christ taught. I believed that he was a prophet. I believed in God as one God. I believed that man's relation with God is direct, without intercessor. I believed that we are accountable for our actions. I could not believe that we carried the taint of original sin, a sin that we never committed. I was at odds with Trinitarian theology, but I was in agreement with everything Jesus Christ taught. And I found these two to be different and no priest could explain this to me. For a couple of years, I was searching, not finding anything, because in the West, in America, really about the last religion most people even think to consider is Islam. It wasn't until I learned about Islam, about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that everything suddenly made sense. Everything fell in place. The Old Testament's prediction of three prophets to follow, John the Baptist being one, Jesus Christ being two, who is the third? The prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Everything else fell in, in place. All of the teachings of Jesus Christ, his teaching that God is one, his teaching that the prophets, including himself, were men, his teaching that we are directly accountable to God without intercessor. 
no saints in the way, no priests that you have to make confession to or seek absolution from. No, our account is directly to God without intercessor. And I found the consistency in the creed throughout the chain of revelation. This was my reason for embracing Islam. I found in Islam the answer to my search in the continuity of the chain of revealed revelation. I found Islam as the conclusion in the chain of revelation. Now, that's my story. It's a very personal story. And maybe nobody benefits from it except for me. But it seems like everybody has a testimonial. And God guides who he wills. And if you are sincere, he will guide you to the straight path. But if you have some disease in your heart, if you have some insincerity, if you have some desire for the world where you do not put God as your priority, you can easily fall into this trap. You start out thanking God and you end up directing your worship to an element of his creation, worshiping the creation instead of the creator. A few years later, as a doctor, I had a patient who had a son who was born with a lethal heart problem. It looked like he was going to die. She prayed to God. She asked for God to save her child, and she promised. Her child got better, the same as mine had. And you know what? She didn't keep her promise. She went back on it. And I guess that kind of concludes my story, because when I saw that, I realized that I didn't become Muslim because I'm so smart, because I figured it out, whereas somebody else maybe didn't. No. Here was this woman in the exact same situation. She was praying for the salvation of her child with a lethal heart defect, just as I had had a child with a lethal heart defect. And what was the difference between the two of us? The difference was simply that Allah guided me to Islam and made me sincere. And for whatever reason, she did not. She failed in her test. If there was one message I would send to the audience, it is just this. We come to the religion of truth not on our own, except as we ask for it. Allah guides those who he wills. Pray to Allah by whatever name you know him. Pray to the Creator with sincerity. Ask him to guide you in your heart and in your mind to the religion of truth and to make you pleased with it. And you will find, if you are sincere, and if Allah answers your prayer, you will find that the religion of truth enters your heart. And inshallah, you will join us as a brother or sister in Islam. Thank you for being my audience on yet another episode, Interfaith Issues. We will continue again, inshallah, and I, I look forward to being with you then. Peace, and may God be with us all. I feel the peace, feel the peace inside, of me. inside of me, a complete tranquility. I remember Allah. Remembers me, feel the peace, feel the breeze.